But this is the start. This isn't the introduction. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make a few announcements because um, everybody's maybe a little confused. Good morning. Have y'all had breakfast? <laughs> we made breakfast a scavenger hunt today. <laughs> Sorry about that. If you didn't, there's still some uh, some. Oh, this is loud. Anyway, um, how's it been this week? Yeah, I know. It's just it. It's last last year. I think we were getting back on the horse, but um, this year it felt like we were really riding. It was uh, it was terrific to have all of you here and all the all the contributions from the community and the opportunity to go look at lovely places like Umlauf and explore Austin. It's just been wonderful. So thank you all for being here. I, um, I wanted to let you know a little bit more about how today's going to go. They're saying there's, there might be rain. So Julianne told me she's got the big six seater, uh, uh, golf cart ready. If anybody needs a ride over to trustee. So once we wrap up here, we've got one session, one block of sessions. And then we're going to come back here and do the roundtable conversations. And um, some of those are going to be virtual. So if you look at the list and decide you want to join one of the virtual ones, just go find a quiet place out of the ballroom. Because I think if you tried to join the virtual from the noisy ballroom, if this year is anything like years past, once the round tables get going, the noise level just because everybody's pretty excited about the conversations that they're having. So if you decide you want to join a virtual round table rather than one of the ones that's here in the ballroom, there are you've probably seen those high benches and tables out along there. There's some quiet rooms. There are those little round tables downstairs along the hallway. I think there are even classrooms over there that you could that you could go in trustee um, to join those virtual ones. And then, of course, there are going to be a lot of lively conversations right here in this room, too. So th those will be the round tables. And then lunch, and this is, I think, a promise that I've heard, will be here. <laughs> Not we, we won't make you chase around upstairs, downstairs, where's breakfast, where's lunch? So um, so that's going to be at noon, right at noon, you'll have lunch back on those tables served again in individual boxes. So you can um, find a place here or wander. And then at one o'clock down in the Jones Auditorium, the closing keynote, I hope a lot of you are staying and not getting early flights out of town because um, I think it's going to be a really profound conversation between Yuta Trevoranis and Kelsey Ruger about the future of AI as it relates to disability inclusion and um, accessibility and how how we're we're going to think about the work that we do with this new AI interjection. So that I think that's going to be tremendous. I, I can't wait. I'm really excited about that. So once again, I just want to thank you all. Thanks for being here. And um, I'm going to introduce a good friend of ours. Chris Law is the, um, oh, I've known Chris for many years. I can't even remember now how we met, but he runs the um, ITC testing symposium is that what it's called and the and the legal symposium he's he's really great about starting conversations around the things that matter in our community and um most recently he started an effort called standard accessibility reporting and i don't know if y'all have had this experience but it seems like sometimes you get three accessibility experts in the room but you have four opinions or maybe even five opinions. You know, it's, I, I think there's a lot of room for interpretation in the guidelines and um, 
And so the idea that we need to create a standard way that we report the things that we find. And Chris is gonna tell you all about it. Um, Nobility recently joined as a strategic partner because I think this is a really tremendously important effort and um, we're, we're excited to be part of it. It's just now um, in the planning stages, we're joining the strategic planning meetings. And I think Chris is here probably to invite all of you to consider doing the same thing. So. Chris Law, thank you for being here and take it away. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, everybody. Um, the, the title, don't expect a winner in the game if there isn't a scoreboard. Um, our tagline for standard accessibility reporting is consumers demand uh, accessibility. I, I think, uh, I hope that that will come through in this presentation. So let's, uh, uh, I will be one of the people uh, doing a, uh, a round table discussion. So if you have longer questions and you wanna have a conversation, uh, that's the time to do it as well. But I should, uh, I should have some time for questions at the end here. Okay. And if you would just hold questions to the end, uh, that's another point. Okay, so do you have the captions running in the room? Do you need the captions running in the room in here or not? Do you need the captions in the room here? Yes. Just want to make sure. All right, so uh, visual description of this image here. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you need captions over this side, it's better, yeah. Okay, uh, so this is, a, this is a picture of a lady at a, uh, um, a slot machine. So uh, do you like to gamble when you're looking to buy a product that meets your needs? Okay, we don't generally like to gamble. People gamble for fun, some people, not myself, but some people do. But you don't generally like to gamble uh, when you're buying products. We have standards, and uh, this is the, uh, an image of the standard electrical outlet for uh, North America. When you buy a product, you generally expect that that will go into a wall socket no matter which building you're in in the entire United States or Canada, okay? Uh, well, the reason for that is uh, standards. There's no gambling here, okay? Standards are all around us in, you know, enabling your phone to work, um, uh, enabling you to get here, uh, standards to run the airport. Standards are everywhere. Uh, not in accessibility as much yet, but that's what we're looking to change. Okay. There were uh, there was a time when there, was, there were no seat belts <laughs> in cars, and Ralph Nader got quite upset about this and wrote a book. Um, this is an image of a uh, 2012 Honda Odyssey uh, in a crash test in a lab setting, and by the looks of it, um, the people in the front if there were actual people in the front, they wouldn't be having a good time, okay? They're likely not to survive this. Um, so uh, crash testing, you know, uh, there was a time when crash testing standards didn't exist. And companies that were not so big on safety uh, were were not they were they were advertising based on other factors other than safety and uh companies that were doing safety like volvo uh, as soon as crash test ratings came in they said this is great this is great because we're the winners and uh we're doing well the other companies had to really catch up over a period of time okay so people want to be safe uh and they want to know that they're going to be safe before they make their purchasing decision. So on every car in North America, 
uh, you will find a five-star crash test rating on a car. And you can decide, am I going to buy a two-star rated car, maybe a sports car that will flip over around corners? Is that, am I young, free, and single, and I, I have the wind in my hair? Or do I want a four or five-star rated car to take my family around? Well, people want the four or five star, okay. So the, the results of these tests tell the consumer what's going on. They also tell the manufacturer what's going on. You, you, you missed the step in the design of this car. You may wanna rethink this, okay. So it's not just uh, crash test results. This is a this is a standard sticker for um, uh, fuel economy. Uh, it gives you a comparison to other types of cars and how much uh, fuel economy you're going to get out of this. Consumers make their decisions based off of many many factors. Yeah, and uh, so this is this is just one of those things. So uh, there's certain factors that you're not going to find out. You like you. You still want to go take a test drive of a car, see how it feels. But those other factors are important, price, uh, safety, uh, fuel efficiency, those types of things. OK. Uh, we certainly don't get asked to go uh, crash test the cars ourselves or go measure the fuel efficiency ourselves. The, the, the dealer at the showroom doesn't say, hey, uh, take this car out and, and see if you want to do a fuel efficiency test. That's not our job, is it? OK. All right, so we have standards talking about um, nutrition labels. This is on every food item for sale in the United States. Uh, this is the standard FDA, Food and Drug Administration label. You'll see that the, uh, the, the big number is calories. Well, it's, it's a big number because that's the standard. It was updated just a few years ago, uh, the, the calories count used to be very small, just like all the other texts. And the FDA said, no, actually, this, is, this needs to be bigger. Let's change the standard. And um, so people got together, uh, and they basically said, you know, uh, all these manufacturer claims like heart healthy or good for you or low fat, you know, the, this is what preceded having these labels. People just basically got fed up because they didn't know what was in the food and they didn't really trust what was being said. So they said, enough is enough. We're going to create a new rule. Also related to food, there's, there's another decision that you might have later on. Uh, and that decision is, do I, do I put this food in my mouth? Right? <laughs> okay. Um, you look at the date. On the on the food, uh, as you pull it out of the cupboard or the refrigerator, and it says, some say best buy, some say used by, sell by, consume by, best before, best if used by, display until. That one's for the uh, supermarkets. Packed on, baked on, manufactured on, freeze by, expires on. Yeah, all of these different things. It's actually worse than that. Um, because there's no standard on, on how the, the label should look. I've got a montage here of lots of different food labels uh, uh, for, for dates. Uh, there's no standardization on font. There's no standardization on the format of the date. Does the year come first? Does the year come last? Uh, if, if you look closely in the middle there, uh, there's a one that says it's best by April uh, and April 20, 29, 19, let's guess that's April 29th, uh, 2019, at one twenty-eight a.m. So, so long as you get in there before one twenty-seven a.m., you know, those will taste good. After, after that, they'll taste terrible. Okay, so there's no standardization on terms. So, uh, remember before we were talking about the Food and Drug Administration. Well, the date part, is under the jurisdiction of the US Department of Agriculture. They say on their website, there are no uniform or universally accepted descriptions used on food labels for open dating in the United States. 
they further go on to say, the USDA estimates that 30% of the food supply is lost or wasted at the retail and consumer levels. One source of food waste arises from consumers or retailers throwing away wholesome food because of confusion about the meaning of dates displayed on the label. Same government, different outcomes, different department, different interests. Who would stand to lose the most if America didn't have to throw away 30% of its food? There's a lot of manufacturers who have a vested interest in selling us 30% more than we actually need. So the money's going in there somewhere. Consumers may be concerned about this, the effect on the environment of 30% extra. We know that harvesting and growing food takes a lot out of the environment. So who's winning here? Okay. We're talking though about accessibility, not food this morning, um, even though you're still enjoying your breakfast. Uh, we are talking about accessibility. And what I hear you say, I hear you say, but Chris, we do have standards. Yes, we have WCAG in our second speech bubble here. Okay. Uh, no, you don't actually, no, sorry. Um, WCAG is a requirement standard of what the product should do. It's not the, a, a standard on how you report the test results. You don't actually have much from WCAG that can help the average consumer in a purchasing decision as to whether they'll use a website or an app or that sort of thing. But I also hear you say, no, 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 we have our own scores that we report to clients. And we have VPATs and ACRs too, okay? No, no, what you've really got is you've got a binary reporting system. That binary reporting system is, did I work on accessibility? Yes or no? That's it, that's all the consumer knows really. Let me explain what I mean, okay. People are used to using scores and ratings for uh, uh, that others have produced uh, and they'll use those to, to make their purchasing decisions. So, so here we've got two scores. Um, uh, it's a sort of typical Amazon uh, five-star rating. Uh, on the left, we've got a uh, product that is four and a half stars out of, based on 33,000 plus reviews. On the right, we've got a product that is four stars based off of 27 reviews. So all things being equal, which, which one are you gonna buy? You're gonna buy the one that, uh, that most people have rated uh, pretty well. Yeah, the one on the left. The, uh, uh, here is another one. Uh, uh, this is from a British site. Uh, it, the product on the left, four and a half stars from 21 and a half thousand pounds. And the one on the right is three stars, costs you more, 25,000 pounds. So I think I'll, I'll choose the one on the, the left, okay? Here's a simple uh, score based off of two different refrigerators. Uh, one is scored 79 and one is scored 64. Which one am I likely to buy? Okay. So who is winning? I have a montage image here of uh, uh, sports teams uh, celebrating their championship wins, you know, from all different, from hockey to, to soccer to um, uh, other Olympic sports. Okay. So competition is a motivator. Okay. To be the best, you've really got to put the work in. Okay. And you get recognition for the fact that you've put the work in. Okay. And the people in the bottom right uh, of this, this image, uh, they're on the podium, they're jumping up and down for joy. They're so happy that they won, okay? But if you take a, quite, uh, a bit of a closer look at uh, the faces of the people on the podium, and, and here I have a medal ceremony from like an Olympic event, and the, 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 the person, uh, the guy holding up his gold medal uh, looks really pleased with himself, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. The person who came in second, 
Uh, he's got a little British jacket on here. Uh, he looks fairly pleased. He got silver. He did pretty well. Well, look at the, the, the people who came in third and fourth. Uh, they, they, the person on the far right looks, looks utterly defeated. Yeah. He came in fourth out of the entire world. And he looks like when he goes home, he's, he's going to get an earful. Okay. How do we identify winning companies in the world of accessibility? Okay. For all the winners, you've got to have a set of losers. Okay, if you want to identify the winners, there will be losers. This is a montage image of the, the teams that didn't quite make it and uh, they're sitting in the locker room or on the field uh, looking, let's, let's face it, they look defeated. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, if you didn't put in quite enough effort uh, and you didn't uh, have enough to win the big game, okay, again, how do we identify the losing companies in the world of accessibility, okay? Competition drives innovation. Is that right? Yeah. This is what we have. This is us. This is the accessibility testing field. These are participation medals, okay? On the, on the left, I have one that says, if you had fun, you won. And on the, the right, there's a medal with a big smiley face and a thumbs up. It says, it's the taking part that counts. Participation medal. Okay, everyone's a winner or a loser, depending on how you look at it. What's your point of view? Okay. Um, did you have fun? It's the taking part that counts. Okay. The taking part that counts. I'm here to tell you that's that's what you're saying when you're saying you, you're working 2.1 double A conformant. You took part. You don't believe me? Okay. Take a look at our current scoreboards, okay? Over on field one, uh, the uh, first semi-final is going on and the home team is leading, maybe. They're a B plus over the visiting team. They're on 78%. Who's winning? Uh, on the other field, field two, uh, the other game, we have a, another close one, maybe. Not sure. Uh, one of them is three out of five stars. For the home team and the uh, the visitors are rated compliant. Okay, who who won? Who's winning? We don't know. Okay. So if you ask four different testing companies, accessibility testing companies, and you say, "Could you please test this website for WCAG 2.1 AA?" Four different companies. They're all uh, testing uh, Acme.com's website and to see whether uh, it. Uh, accessible. The first company is rating them B plus, the second 78%, the third three out of five stars, and the fourth one says, well, they're compliant. Okay. So that's, that's how accessibility scoring is being done in our field right now. Every company is doing it differently. Okay. So what does this actually mean for the consumer? It's just a participation medal because I can't compare one to another. If I'm trying to buy a car and I'm trying to test, so I'm trying to figure out safety ratings like this, doesn't work that way. Okay. So it's really saying, look, uh, you know, I, uh, I participated. I, uh, I tried my best. We have a company uh, who would say, hey, look, we spent $2 million on accessibility and we still got sued, right? Well, what do we say? Well, sorry, there, there isn't really a winning score. Yeah. How much have you got to spend to make your things accessible? Well, you could do it for 50 bucks and you could do it for $5 million, right? Um, so the person says, uh, look, you know, you're just telling me that we have no winning score, okay? Here's another quote, uh, I fell for the marketing, 100% accessible with just one line of code. That's not fair, right? That's not fair, okay? But there's no rules in the game. So you can claim it's 100% accessible, but there's no rules. 
So you can just declare yourself the winner. Other aspects of society creeping into what we're doing. Okay. Here's another quote. Look, all I want to know is whether my site is accessible. And you're telling me it depends on who you ask. It's not good enough. How do these people know that they're better than their competition? Let's get to the VPAT. Why is the, why is the VPAT binary? Okay. The VPAT is uh, um, basically a 50-page table or so. I've got a thumbnail image here of all the different pages of a 50-page table. And um, the, the, the message from the manufacturer is, here, read this, and you decide whether this is accessible enough for you. Okay? If you are good enough, you have the skills to understand what's in here, okay, you might find way down at the bottom near the end that there's some factor in here that's listed that says that this is either good enough or not good enough for you, okay? It's a treasure hunt, okay? On the, on the cover page, it doesn't tell you whether the thing is, is accessible or not, okay? There's no score. There's no way to know whether it was a valid test method that was used to, to create it. Um, so it's a binary thing. We, we hear of people saying, um, you know, it's got a VPAT, it's accessible. Yeah? As, uh, as uh, uh, one prominent uh, uh, person said this week, most VPATs are horrible. That was Jeff Klein speaking on Wednesday morning. He says, he's, he's read thousands of VPATs, and he says accuracy varies wildly from vendor to vendor, product to product. Okay. If I'm at the car dealership and I say, hey, how, how safe is this car? And the dealer says, give me a minute. I'm just going to run back into the office and print out a 50-page table from the manufacturer, and you can read it at your leisure. This is what we're doing with the VPAT. It's not good enough. Okay. Four companies are bidding on the government CMS contract. Okay. They, they all have different names of uh, uh, their, uh, their system for a new CMS system. They've all got a VPAT. Here's all the cover pages. Which one's the winner? Which is the best one? Okay. So remember... As a procurement office official, you've got two days to review all of these. No, you don't. No, so sorry. No, you've got you've got about two minutes to assess all of these because you're assessing loads and loads of other things. Okay, which one's the most uh, accessible? Which one's the most compliant? All it says is we did accessibility. We didn't do accessibility. That's all it is. Okay. So we are currently like the U.S. Department of Agriculture, okay? We are the, the variable dates that are confusing people, uh, leading to sort of 30% of wastage, okay? Anybody here uh, wasted a few afternoons reading a VPAT? Yeah, see, see quite a few hands. What if it just said A plus on one and D minus on the other? Well... I don't really need to read the D minus one, do I? Maybe I'll just skim through and check the A plus one. Okay. I mentioned car, uh, uh, test, uh, car testing before, car crash testing. Um, you know, basically it was enough people got fed up. The people who got fed up were actually the, the insurance industry. Car, car crash testing was started by the insurance industry. They wanted fewer payouts. They wanted fewer injuries. They could keep their, their premiums at the same and pay out less money. That's good business. Okay. Are consumers uh, fed up? Can they make the change? You know, what great strides have been made in accessibility in the last few years? Have we had any big, huge shifts? Consumers 
generally don't demand accessibility for consumer technology products right now. They don't really know that they can. So um, what happens? What happened to food when the FDA put the nutrition label? Things generally started getting a bit healthier. Manufacturers started paying attention to how much sugar and fat and uh, calories were in a serving and, and making adjustments. Okay. It enabled consumers to make better decisions. We need to uh, we need to do the same sort of thing. Okay. I'm assuming everybody in here has heard of the WebA Million. Let me know if you haven't. The WebA Million. Okay. So you know you know roughly what's happening with the the WebA Million. Okay. This is a this is a chart showing our progress over, over the last five years. Okay. Look at the trend line here. We have. Uh, in 2019, almost all, 98% of sites were not considered accessible. And in the five years that has gone down to, let's say it's around 97%. It's a fairly flat, flat, shallow slope line. This is, this is our progress. This is what we're doing. Again, what is, what is our major thing that we're going to do to change this? Because at this rate, in about 250 years, you're going to have accessible websites on the Starship Enterprise. Okay? Maybe we shouldn't wait that long. These are consumer technology products from, uh, from my home, actually. These are um, washing machine, uh, dryer, uh, refrigerator, freezer, coffee machine, uh, oven, alarm system, thermostat. None of these devices talk. Okay. My, my watch talks. These devices don't talk for people who are blind to be able to use them, people with low vision. Okay. Does, does anyone have a talking washing machine here? No, no. Okay. When did you think, when do you think Speak and Spell came out? First consumer technology product that featured speech. 1978. And yet, currently, there's no seemingly, uh, seemingly, there's no driver for technology companies that make washing machines to make their washing machines talk. Can't be done. You can't make the thing talk. Well, I don't know. If my watch can talk and speak and spell was made in 1978. I think it's pretty easy. So the power really becomes in the purchasing decisions that, that consumers make, okay? We need to take gambling out of the process, uh, not just for websites, but for consumer technology products as well, okay? Uh, you know, do I, do I buy this? Do I invest my money in this? Um, so people in the accessibility testing field, a number of us, we basically got fed up. We got fed up with this situation and decided to do something about it. And that's why we created this new organization to create standards for reporting on accessibility. Okay. It's our logo again. Okay. Here I have an image of the big I voted sticker that you get uh, when you go to the polling place. I voted today. Uh, industry consensus standards is what we're trying to uh, generate. Um, the uh, our fa our foundational principle is basically by the industry for the industry. So industry, everybody in this room would count as industry. You know, developers, testers, academics, consumer review organizations, disability organizations, technology companies, academics, uh, government as well. Okay. And member driven, member voted, the members decide what we do, how we do it, and whether to adopt it. And anybody can become a member. Okay. What are we uh, actually going to do? We're going to develop the label. That's the first thing we're going to do is to create this. Uh, the, there's a number of standards behind the nutrition facts label, you know, the, the font sizes. Uh, what the content is, um, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, we need to pretty much do the same sort of thing 
for accessibility of products and websites. So uh, here I have a sort of sample mock-up, a possible mock-up from the future uh, when you have an accessibility facts label. You've got two washing machines here. Uh, one's got an overall accessibility rating of A and the other one's got an accessibility rating of D. Let's say you've got uh, difficulty hearing and you're, you're, you want to find out more information. So below that, uh, below the, uh, the main rating, you have, can I use this product depending on what my functional lim limitations are? So you can see that actually both of them can be used with reduced hearing. They both pass that test. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're if you're blind, low vision, uh, or you have no hearing at all, uh, you can use the product on the left, not the product on the right. So consumers then can say, okay, uh, this helps. If I've got limited hearing, I can use either product. If I'm blind, I'm re really going to buy the product on the left. Okay. Again, this obviously doesn't exist yet. We need to come together and create this and figure out how these scores are generated. The second thing we need to do is to develop uh, validation methods. People cheat on tests. We know this, okay? So uh, did, you car did you crash your car into a wall, right? And did the, all the people inside survive, right? Here, I've got two images where um, one, they didn't survive, but the other, they survived. They both crashed into a wall. The wall on the, uh, the, the one on the left is from the lab-based uh, uh, testing, and the, the uh, one on the right is a car crashing into a wall of empty cardboard boxes. Yeah, we crashed into a wall. Everybody survived. It was great. Okay. So you need to validate the test method. Now, in accessibility testing, there's hundreds of different test methods for websites. Everybody's got a different test method. Some use automated mixed with manual tests. And we need to provide a mechanism for, you, for people to say, okay, this test method provides a valid reliable score okay um so the one on the left here the, the the lab we know that the car is failing the test we know that the test is valid everybody's agreed the test is valid the one on the right uh the car we don't know whether the car is safe or not because the test mes method is invalid okay not valid okay trust but verify okay so we thought this through as to all the different elements that you need. Our first order of business is going to be websites, okay? Remember this, uh, this chart from WebAIM and the WebAIM Million, okay? The blue line represents the chart just going off that, that this, this is the 250-year the 250 time frame, okay? The same old, same old. If we keep doing the same old, same old, that's what we're going to have. We're not going to have anything uh, different. So we need to produce some sort of radical change. Scoring things, what gets measured improves. Right now, we don't have a measurement system. Okay. Second order of business is going to be consumer technology products. Okay. So if I think of um, browsing for, uh, for products online right now, using a popular consumer product buying website. It might give me a sort uh, capability that says uh, sort by featured. We all know what featured means, right? Featured means sponsored, right? Uh, someone paid for this and that's always the default. Uh, or price low to high, price high to low, uh, or average customer review. How about adding accessibility score? Why don't I filter by accessibility score? Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, and then when I have the results pop up, um, we've got one that's highlighted. We've got some microwave ovens here. Uh, one says uh, it's the best seller. It's tagged by the company as the best seller. And the other one is tagged as the most accessible. 
And on the left, we, uh, we have a, a sort of a mock-up of the filters that you would use to pick out your microwave oven. So you can filter by brand, by color, by size, by price, by consumer review, or by accessibility score. This is the way I think that the world should work. I'd love somebody to argue against this. Okay, but this is the way the world doesn't work, needs to work. Again, consumers demand accessibility. If all the microwaves come up there with a crap score for accessibility, first off, I'd be kind of happy because then everybody would see that they're getting crappy scores. And maybe something might change. Maybe we'll have a talking microwave. Yeah? Okay, so those things, those highlighted items, most accessible, accessibility score. So again, I said, uh, you know, the title of this talk is don't expect a winner in the game if there isn't a scoreboard. Okay, we need to help the consumers know who the winners are and who the losers are. Okay, well, who's we? We is us. We is us, everybody in this room. Those connected on the call uh, today, uh, attending remotely. Anyone in this field can join. We are extremely open. Uh, anybody can participate. Anyone can get involved. Anyone can get a vote in whether we do these things. Okay, so in every game, uh, there are spectators. We've got a bubble here for spectators. Uh, players. Another bubble for players and rule makers, and the players and the rule makers overlap. So think of it, any sport you, you like, there are people watching from the stands, the armchair quarterbacks, uh, there are the people playing the game, and there are people making the rules, uh, and they change the rules frequently in, in many sports, okay. So in the game of making purchasing decisions, we're just like when football teams decided, no, I'd like to play a game called rugby football. And another group said, I'd like to play Australian rules football. Another group said, I'd like to play uh, American football, NFL. These all diverged from one thing called football. And it was just teams of people saying, you know what? Let's get together and create some new rules because we want to do it differently. And that's all we're doing. We're coming together to create a new set of rules because we want people to do things differently. Okay. The, the players in this situation, you know, of uh, uh, consumer product uh, purchasing decisions, you might think of the spectators being the customers uh, making decisions, the players being the manufacturers of the uh, site, the people who make accessibility test processes, test processes like us. Um, they are players, but they can also become rule makers. So if you work in this field, um, you can do that. Now, again, Sean Henry stood up here the other day and said, we have a resource for that. So they've gotten to the stage of creating things for the things that they need. We have a resource for that. For us, there is no resource for that. We've got to create it. But we can't do it unilaterally. There's no point me making a proposed standard and telling everybody, hey, everybody, I made a standard. It doesn't work like that. We need to get everybody involved. Okay? This is a team effort. So maybe in the future, you know, I'll be out of sight, come up here again and say, no, we have a resource for that now. We have a standard reporting system, a standard validation method. Uh, feel free to use it. Okay. So if you would like to be here in the rulemaking section, join us. Please join us. You can sit on the sidelines and be a spectator. That's okay. Uh, you can carry on gambling. Uh, we're back to the image of the lady at the slot machines. So, um, yeah, you can carry on gambling. Don't forget the house always wins. Yeah. 
not the consumer. Okay. The gamblers are the participants. They're, they're paying a very high price for what they're not getting. Thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Cheers. So we can take questions both out of the room and online. For the online participants, if you would use the raise hand feature of Zoom, which can be found under the reactions button. Uh, we'll also keep track of the chat as well. And uh, if oh. in the room here, if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll come to you with a microphone. Yeah, and I'll put up the, uh, the website here, Standard Accessibility Reporting Incorporated. So it's standardari.org. I know it's early. Do we have any questions? But if you had enough coffee, I'll take any question that you have. I have uh, one online from Jennifer. How do we prevent the interest of the accessibility at the edge W3C interest group, in parentheses, trying to validate overlays, in parentheses, getting into this or slowing progress down? Yeah. Yeah, well, this is... Thank you for the question uh, about overlays. Uh, overlays are, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with Carl Groves on um, uh, the documents that we've produced about overlays. Um, for the consumer, they don't know. They, they, they basically get uh, uh, told a lie that it's 100% accessible with one line of code. Um, and those companies uh, have tried to basically get themselves in with uh, um, large organizations doing disability work. So for example, they tried to sponsor NFB's conference. Uh, accidentally, they, they managed to get listed as a sponsor before somebody pointed it out and they were promptly removed and told don't come to our conference, right? They, uh, they joined IAAP and IAAP subsequently changed their uh, terms and conditions to say you couldn't use false advertising. So uh, those groups are still trying. There's a lot of money in there, okay? But I think if we have, if we together develop a validation method, that validation method is going to show you what the score is for an overlay. It's going to show you that without the overlay, maybe your website scores an E or an F for accessibility. With the overlay, maybe you score a D. You don't score an A. We're not there yet. Artificial intelligence is not there yet to, to bump this up to a level of an A. No way. So we need to stay on top of that. And yeah, we are, uh, we are talking with W3C ourselves. So uh, we're having those conversations. Chris, thank you for your talk this morning. I appreciate it. Um, I'm really compelled by what you've presented. And you. I've been sitting here racking my brain trying to think of what um, would be a good parallel for some of the presenting, some like the FDA versus the US Department of Agriculture. And the only thing I can come up with right now is the US Access Board. I feel mm -hmm. as though they would be you know, a, a interesting parallel. And I just like your thoughts on that. Because sure. They're doing some really uh, hard work. Yeah, the access, the access board is a bit like the W3C that they write the requirements for what the thing should be, right? And so they've adopted W3C for the web. They, they didn't in the, first, in the first instance when 508 came out. Uh, so um, they, they leave others to enforce things. So for example, um, they will let the US Department of Justice be the enforcement group. Uh, uh, but they for the ADA and they write the accessible the access board writes the accessible the guidelines for the ADA so um, uh, there's there's uh, GSA as well uh, might be a, a, a spot to do this as well um, but I think that you know when we look when we look back on the evolution of the VPAT you know uh, and if you think about that 30% food wastage and you compare it to the VPAT, 
Um, the, the V means voluntary, but it's not voluntary anymore. The, the, the government requires a VPAT, right? And that's why lots of companies that don't do accessibility have to scramble to, to, to try to form a VPAT. Um, we are not a lobbying organization. We're not, we're not talking, uh, we're not lobbying for any changes in rules or laws yet. Uh, it's not what we do. But I think that once we've produced something and someone finds out that you could either have a VPAT plain vanilla, or you could have the VPAT with a validated score. Do I think that companies and um, government departments might say, send us a VPAT, but don't bother sending it without a validated score? Maybe that could happen in the future. Yeah. Thanks for the question. So from Stephanie online, it's, can you speak more about the current state of the, this work? How far along are you? What's next and timelines? Sure, thank you. Uh, we've really just started. Uh, so we are forming our membership base and where we are right now is we formed a standards development committee, uh, oversight committee made of elected members, elected by the membership. Uh, and we are at the stage of creating um, RFPs and requests for interests, that sort of thing. So we're in the stages of drafting those uh, our model of operation is going to be uh, to have uh, paid standards developers. So they will be, because they're paid, you can give them a timeline. Uh, most people, when they think standards, they think three, five, seven years. Uh, uh, other, you know, you, you've seen how long it took from the first version of 508 to the second version of 508. It took uh, more than 508 weeks to do that. Okay, so uh, that's our that's our model, uh, but that's where we are right now. We're still growing our membership, which is partly why I'm here to talk to people, um, and uh, we're developing those RFPs, developing the the information to go out to people to create those standards. Yes, there was a question here. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm wondering if there are um, precedents or examples from existing uh reporting standards to deal with some of the complexities of accessibility reporting yeah including i'll mention two one is dynamic websites that change for yep. every user another is the judge the judgmental nature of some of the accessibility standards such as um, adequacy or appropriateness of text alternatives for images yeah subjective uh, do we have other standards that deal with dynamic content or products and deal with uh with this, not with difficult yeah. to measure uh judgmental uh, attributes well yeah absolutely so when we when we started this 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 actually this initiative really started in 2019 uh, where I held a number of, uh, you know, sessions with members of the accessibility testing field to say, should we do this? And a lot of these conversations happened. Well, what about this situation? What about that situation? And um, uh, my response is really that you, you've got to get everybody into the room and have those arguments, but you've got to end up with, with a score and it's never going to be perfect. And if you think about it, you know, I, I tell people, look, think about the crash test rating. It's a four out of five star uh, system. Now, imagine what the room is like when they're trying to figure out what goes into four stars versus five stars. And Joe works on front crash test impact and thinks that that's the most important thing. And Sally works on... Uh, rollovers and says that's most important this happens more often this causes more uh injuries which, which things go into it and um another aspect of it is that it evolves over time so it used to be that you could get a five-star crash test rating without having automatic braking then somebody came along and invented automatic braking 
and said to other car manufacturers, I patented this and you can have it in your car for $500. And, um, and then the insurance company said, you know what, this is a good idea. We're going to say that from this date forwards, you will need to have automatic front braking in order to get a five-star rating. Otherwise, your maximum is four. So you've got to have this evolution and you've got to have discussions. Uh, it will never be perfect. You, you've also got to think about it in terms of like, do you ex if you excluded one disability group, you know, in that example, I, I showed that a company was excluding three, at least three disability groups. Could you get a five-star rating? Well, I don't think so, but we need to have that discussion. But right now, someone could say, look, we tested for WCAG and 98% of what we did, uh, is we've covered, right? So we get an A-plus gold star, right? And say, well, the, the one thing you didn't do was captions. So now deaf people can't use your thing. So I don't think that deserves an A-plus gold star. Yeah. So those, those sorts of discussions really do have to happen. Uh, that's why we set up our group to do that. Yeah. We, we have Thank time you. for one or two more questions. Um, also, I've uh, shared on the screen our survey QR code and link, and that's also been posted in the announcements channel. If anybody else needs more assistance with that, just see me right after this. We, we really uh, appreciate the feedback that you uh, give our instructors, our presenters, and the event. Online from Rhiannon, we have, how can we create a standard set of rules slash tests for something that can be subjective based on user type and application? The usability of the site, for instance. Yeah. How does this differ from running an automated test on a site and listing out the score? Sure, actually, yeah. So um, if you go to our site and look at our list of board members, one of the, our board members is from Nielsen Norman Group, who is a big, a big usability testing company. We have a couple of usability testing companies that have joined us already as members. Usability, I think, is uh, is a key factor. You know, usability and accessibility have had this dance over the last uh, 20, 30 years um, where um, they really haven't uh, sat down together and, and figured this out. So I think the use element has to come into it. So... Uh, yeah, I don't envisage something being an automated scoring system at all. I envisage that there's lots of factors that are going to be coming into play. You know, for cons for consumer products testing, you know, wouldn't contacting customer support be in there, right? What's it's it's part of the user experience. So how does that play in? Does that factor into the score? Those are the types of things we need to figure out. But yeah, certainly not envisaging any kind of automated um, tick the boxes on WCAG and and come up with a score. I think it would be more complicated than that. More, There's more to do. So, okay. I know you've got to get Any off to your next questions? session. So uh, again, I will be sitting here in the, um, uh, the round table discussions, come up and chat if you want to know more details, if you want to know how much it costs to join, all those types of things, uh, what you get for your membership um why it's why it's worth uh, doing uh or any other technical or procedural element i'm happy to discuss uh, thanks very much i've really enjoyed this conference it's the first time I'm, i've been here uh, i appreciate the uh invitation to come and talk by sharon so thank you so much uh, this has been fun thank you very much cheers Yes, go ahead. Uh, these wires are part of this.